thanks for coming. Sorry we were late, but we're here now. Um, my name is Stephanie McBath, and I'm from Saratoga County. I'm Rachel Martin from Westchester County. And we're going to briefly go over what the program is about. As Debbie said, uh, it's a one-year program, and most of us are juniors and seniors in high school. Uh, it's run through the Pro Dairy Program at Cornell University, and the purpose is to broaden our understanding of careers in the dairy industry. A lot of us coming into this probably knew we wanted to go into the industry, but we didn't know where or how. So I think this was really crucial in uh, figuring out what we want to do with the rest of our lives. So in our presentation, we're going to recap all of our activities throughout the year. And we just want to say thank you again for sponsoring and supporting us all year long. So our portion of the presentation is about the National 4-H Dairy Conference that we attended in Wisconsin, and two of our group mates aren't here today, but we're going to do it anyways. Alright, so the first thing we did was all of us met at the Rochester Airport. Some of us knew each other from other things, but not everybody. So we met there, we um, flew out to Madison, and we spent three days touring Wisconsin dairy farms, just as a group, not with the conference. So that was really interesting because we started to see a lot of uh, differences between farms in Wisconsin and farms here in New York State before we even got to the conference. So while we were there, uh, we met over 200 attendees from the United States and Canada, and it was interesting to see that although there were 20-something of us headed out there, some states only sent one person, some states had an application process, we got to meet a lot of interesting people, um, and the purpose of the conference was to expand our knowledge of the industry and enhance our leadership skills, similar to the program that we're in now. It was held on the UW-Madison campus. The first day we went to Fort Atkins in Wisconsin and we visited the Horns Dairyman Farm. We got to take a tour and see all the famous Guernsey herd there. Um, it was interesting to see how they operate. And then we got to see where the magazine is published and we learned about um, different scholarships and internships that Horns Dairyman offers as well as where they actually print the magazine. Um, then we went to the National Dairy Shrine, where we got a tour of the museum, and we saw pictures of the famous cows that we all love. We actually saw a couple pictures of the famous people that we all love, too, so that was pretty awesome. We also went to the NASCO Distribution Center, and we it was interesting for me to learn that NASCO just doesn't do farm and ranch supplies. It also does arts and crafts and school supplies and things like that. So like, we got a tour of the whole center, and we saw some of the animals that they distribute out for scientific purposes as well. We also went to ABS Global, um, and we watched the semen collection there. They have a barn that's kind of the history of ABS, and, and all the famous bulls are up on the wall. That was pretty interesting as well. So while we were at the conference, we were able to participate in a bunch of seminars. Uh, one of the seminars was called Fun with Dairy Foods with Bob Horton. He's from Ohio State University. Um, we were able to make ice cream using liquid nitrogen and mix different flavors. And the purpose was to learn the importance of protein and milk and dairy products such as cottage cheese and yogurt. Um, another seminar we were able to do during the conference was called Being an Advocate. And that was to help us develop skills to interact with consumers and with who have negative comments that they put on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and how to portray how the dairy industry is beneficial. And then we were also able to do some seminars on campus, on the campus. Uh, these are some of them, AI, farm finance, food evaluation, farm day, and we were able to pick three out of that whole list and do them. That's Maddie doing the, uh, I think the bio. Um, some seminars that we were able to both do was the groomment where we were able to look into a Michelin cow which has a whole cow sicker hand to the groomment and we discovered the role and development of the groomment. Uh, another program we were able to do was the food evaluation where we sat in a room and tasted different dairy foods and learned the difference between real and artificial. While we were there at every meal, we actually got to hear from some pretty amazing people and we heard from like six different speakers. These were a few of the ones that we that really kind of we went home with memories of their speaking. One of them was Matthew Bull, who is a dairy focused consultant for Cargill. He lived in New York, he's from New York, he graduated from Cornell, and he talked to us about his career path, where he got to where he is now, how he did that, and the importance of leadership in the industry. 
Kristen Olson is the 66th Alice in Dairyland, so she spoke to us about how she bridges the gap between the producer and the consumer. Um, and that's similar to the Dairy Princess program here in New York State, but she also gets paid a salary, so that's pretty cool. And then we had Matt Moore, who's the VA Commissioner of Agriculture, um, and he talked about his days in 4-H and the importance of 4-H and how it got him where he is today, and then his role as an advocate for agriculture and what he's doing in Virginia. Um, we were fortunate enough to go visit the World Dairy Expo while we were in Madison. Um, we were able to hear from Purebred Dairy Cattle Association representative who spoke to us, and then after that, we were able to explore the expo, and we were able to watch Browns go the milk and short corn show. That was pretty cool, and we were able to see the various innovations that were done. the other states. Everyone had their own pin and we went around and exchanged all of them. Uh, we had casino night, a uh, bunch of group dances. We were able to learn how to square dance and line dance. And we, if you wanted to, you could take a tour on the UW Madison campus. So the last thing we did as part of the conference was we visited Craig Brothers Dairy, which is a large dairy farm in Wisconsin. And you'll hear more about them later. But um, the seminars that we attended while we were there, we spoke with a Purina nutritionist. And same thing, she talked about her career path and what she does in Wisconsin. And then we talked to the nutritionist from Craig Brothers, and he spoke about their crop management plans and the role of nutrition in their herd and their feed efficiency and all that stuff. And then the brothers took us on a farm tour. So again, really need to see the comparisons between New York and Wisconsin because there are some similarities, but there's a lot of differences. Right. So this is where we get into the pictures uh, that Rachel and I put together. A little snippet of our whole year kind of put together. Again, we'll go we'll elaborate yeah. later on. But this is Hewitt at the High Ropes course. Just hang around. Uh, this is Betsy here. When we went to Vermont, it was really hot, and Betsy decided she wanted to cool off. And, well, there she is with Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> yep, Candids. There's a bit of a comparison here. A lot of long days yeah. and two dairy leaders. We were really tired and exhausted and Carrie couldn't handle it anymore and I don't know what yours is going to be. We had a lot of fun. JDL. The expressions were so happy. Love JDL. And there was a lot of sleep. Yeah. Long days. We gotta have your rest. Even if it's on the airport. All right, at this point, we're going to ask the next group to come up and talk about small farm and niche markets. I'm Kayla Windecker from Kirkford County. I'm Wesley Noble, and I'm from Bradford County, Pennsylvania. I'm Cody Sears, and I'm from Montego County. Uh, we'd just like to explain to you a little bit about the small farms and niche markets that we have visited this year. Okay, so one of the places we visited was Dutch Oak Creamery. It's owned and operated by the Ockham family in Shenango Forks, New York, which is just outside of Binghamton. They own 180 acres and milk 130 total head of cows. They began processing milk in the spring of 2013, and the reason they chose to do this was because it was innovative and it was an affordable option for them doing their micro creamery in their renovated garage. Uh, they had an on-farm self-serve store, and they, uh, they also went to farmer's markets where they like to keep a familiar face so people could recognize them and their products. And then they also sold to other local stores. Some of their products, include cheese, European style yogurt, which is yogurt you can drink, and then they also bottle milk. And they also have regular open houses at the farm. Uh, back in 
trip, um, we took a stop at um, Black Willow Pond Farm in Cobusville, New York, owned and operated by Carrie Etzel. Uh, Carrie grew up on a small farm in Orange County, New York, uh, where she served as herd manager for a few years. Uh, she spent two years at Morrisville State and then two years at Cornell. Uh, she was an extension agent in Shenango County for a while, and she moved to North Carolina where she continued work as an extension agent. Uh, while she was in North Carolina, she learned a lot about um, a lot of variety of livestock. So when she returned to New York, she started Black Willow Pond Farm with her family. On Black Willow Pond Farm, they raise pigs, sheep, lay hens, meat chickens, rabbits, and turkeys. Uh, they operate on a rotational grazing system of their 28 acres. Their Yorkshire cross swine are the land clearers, they send them out first. And then Katahdin sheep move around the pasture every day. And the red Cornish and Cornish rock meat birds and the heritage breed laying hens get where the sheep were and they move every five days. Uh, they also raise California and New Zealand cross rabbits and they direct market those to New York City. And on all aspects of the animals we use except for their hide, so it's a near perfect efficiency for the rabbits. And she even has customers that come and buy the rabbit in the market because they play right in the garden. On Black Willow Pond Farm, their big thing is local grown, local sold. Uh, we have a quote here from Carrie. Um, it's kind of her mission statement. She wants to develop a natural and sustainable food production system that allows her family and those in and around her community an alternative to the foods that make the news in a negative way. She just wants high quality food for her family and those that support her business. She attends a couple small farmers markets in Cooperstown and Chad Springs, New York. And she does a lot of sales on her own farm and pre All right. When we went on our Vermont trip last month, we stopped at Harrisburg Goat Dairy, and that was in Randolph, Vermont. Um, this was interesting to go see a goat dairy and see how they operated uh, differently and similar, similarly to uh, a bunch of cattle dairies. Um, they began operation last October. Uh, they built new facilities, and they built 230 dairy goats. Uh, they have the facilities and uh, capacity to reach up to 700 goats. They milk in a double 20 parlor, and it's the first of its kind in the US. Uh, on average, their goats make six pounds of milk a day, um, average 2,400 pounds a year. Um, we did notice that there were some difficulties that you can find in the uh, dairy goat market as opposed to dairy cattle. Uh, it's difficult to find enough animals with records for dairy goats in general for the market that they're looking for. Uh, there's a slower genetic progress to uh, the lack of AI and the expense uh, AI and goat uh, So this is the picture of their double 20 parlor. Uh, they have lots of room to expand. But there are a lot of advantages to goat dairy farming as we can see to cattle dairy farming. Uh, there's a lot less maintenance required with the goats. Um, they, <laughs> they, when, you don't need a hoof trimmer to come in. You can just have an employee reach down and trim the goat's hooves. Uh, you, there's a lot less land required, too. Uh, the, our tour guide said that only took 100 acres of land to feed 400 milking uh, does. Uh, the barns were very interesting to see, also. Uh, some people may know that goats are browsers, so they like to eat up. So the feed alleyways were actually elevated. Uh, some of them were elevated over a foot. Uh, and the farm is also interested in implementing TM operations, uh, but they're interested to see how that will work and see if the goats will adapt to that. Uh, some of the other aspects of the uh, barns were they had lighting implemented that would rip the animals to the because goats are seasonal breeders. Um, and they had an interesting ventilation system, especially in the birthing center, where uh, the air exchange would be at the level of the baby kids. Uh, and this goat, or this goat farm started from a group of seven different investors, uh, and they began this farm because it's close to the processing center, and there is a large demand for goat dairy milk. And this demand uh, really uh, made this farm. Uh, but this, these investor groups really push for sustainability and renewable energy, so there are lots of different projects that are being um, pushed by these different investors on the farm. Um, and then we visited Vermont Creamery, which uh, Ayersbrook actually sent 
Bob Reese and Alison Hooper. Uh, Alison Hooper learned how to make goat cheese in France while she was in college. They currently have 40 employees and they make dairy and uh, dairy cow and dairy goat uh, products. And they won many international awards for multiple products. Uh, they get their milk from 17 different farms in Vermont and 13 different farms in Ontario, Canada. Uh, at the moment, they were, uh, the goat farmers were receiving $50 a hundred weight and high premiums for protein. Uh, it was interesting to see with the dairy goat market that uh, there wasn't such a change in prices of milk and that uh, the, uh, it was steadily on the rise. So that's because the demand for goat products is on the rise. And uh, Mama Marjorie sends uh, markets online and through many retailers throughout the country. And they actually allowed us to try some of their products. Uh, some of them were a little interesting, such as the uh, aged goat cheese. Uh, not too many of us liked them, but they were very interesting to try. Uh, but we did have some creme fresh, which I think everyone loved. And it was just interesting. trip to was Vermont. We crossed the border into Hampshire, to New Hampshire, and we visited McNamara Brothers, which is a 200 cow dairy in Plainfield. And they process about 80 to 90 percent of their milk, and they bottle two times per week. And they have an on-farm self-serve store where they sell their multiple products, such as milk, butter, cream, maple syrup, their own beef, and their own eggs from their chicken. For their maple syrup, they tap 7,000 to 8,000 maple trees annually. And that there is a picture of their bottling plant. And they decided to diversify instead of expand because of their limited resources of land and water. And they are very self-sufficient. Most of the family that went away to college came back home and they have mostly all family labor and they're all incorporated into the business somehow whether it be tapping trees or on the dairy aspect modeling part of it and they build most of their buildings themselves and cut their own lumber from their own forests to make them and i'd like to bring up the leadership team building and personal development group opinions and help them realize how positive the dairy industry is and help them turn that around. She explained to us that we ought to be positive but honest and we ought to advertise our dairy farms using technology and make brochures, magazines, ads, and she even challenged us to make our own brochures and enter it in a competition thing that they had going on. We also had lunch with a few of the Cornell students. Um, they discussed their background information, education, why they chose Cornell, some of the inter internships and jobs they've had, what they're currently doing, and some of the future goals and plans that they, they want to have. They said that we ought to have, that there's many opportunities out there and that we ought to take advantage of most of them, and that there are multiple doors to open and we ought to keep our options open. Um, we also looked at personality profiles at Cornell's campus with Larry Vanderbilt, who is the director of the New York um, for the Ohio State Food and Agriculture Leadership Institute, which is a leadership program for adults in the um, agriculture, food, and natural resource um, area. 
Um, we're working with him in the Thirsty Bates test. We're going to go to the 70 questionnaire with <laughs> looking at different questions for people. And then uh, we analyzed the different happiness um, that by the insight of trying to figure out. One of uh, the four basic temperaments were guardian, idealist, rationalist, and artisans. And it was really interesting because we looked at it in just our JDL group, and we all ended up mostly being guardians. And then we also looked at the statistics for most of the dairy industry, which were also guardians. And we talked about why that was a good thing and why it wasn't. Um, so um, we came up with like each temperament and personality is important. Useful for doing different things within any industry and the dairy industry. So, all different types of people for different things. One activity that the um, PDO group did was the Wilbur Survival Test. It was a test that we did back in December about how we were doing woods in different scenarios. Uh, we did we the test individually first, then uh, the group. And the group scores, you know, we wanted to see that the group scores were back in the group score. Told us to 
what all we were to do if we were in that sort of scenario. And we had we got to the beach and we had to wait um, probably an hour, 45 minutes, something like that, uh, for a smaller storm to clear off. And then he finally let us get into the water. Um, but we weren't in the water for 30 minutes before we saw our first lightning strike. So we all had to get out and line up on the uh, river bank and sit on our tubes 15, or 50 foot apart from each other. And after every lightning strike, we had to wait 15 more minutes before we could get back into the water. So all in all, we ended up waiting and sitting on the bank for two hours. And it was torrential downpours. It was freezing cold. Some of us, our lips turned blue. Um, two kids were stranded on the island. Uh, they decided to have tea. They wouldn't go in the water, so they just they got out of the river for some reason. So they were on an island by themselves, and they were there for two hours by themselves. They were running around and trying to build shelter or something. Um, so. In that two hour time period, the, four, the river had risen uh, four feet. And we were all cold, we were all freezing. Uh, but by the time the storm had passed, we all had to get back in the water and work as a team to get back to the uh, banding zone. And next, we're going to bring up and invite the medium sized dairies. Dairy, and there they had 1,800 cows and around 3,200 acres. 
They were military in the double 20 parallel parlor uh, three times a day, and that was the goals that you get in the house tour. So they also had a single 10 um, special needs parlor for all of their junior and um, fresh cows. Um, they were pushing 15 to 20 percent overcrowding, making 100 pounds a day, and they had a 200,000 um, Spanx L count. They were actually founded in 1887. Uh, they're currently eighth generation. It was in the cover of buildings called the cows and the cell extra cost. Um, on the top, we see their special needs parlor that they use for all of the fresh cows and treated animals. And at the bottom, we have heated wet calf stalls and the calf seat. Um, their individual boxes for the first day. Um, at the top, there's a uh, Hot air that blasts on um, Here we see their um, one of their two coverall barns that they keep all the cows in. And they claim it was very comfortable during the summer, but quite cold during the winter. And their coverall barns let in a lot of light. In 2002, they had an F2 tornado strike the farm and it destroyed both the overall buildings and did a lot of damage to the main structures they had. But they were able to rebuild the barns in 25 days with minimal building loss. And as part of the barn design, they had drover lanes that went on the outside of the barn so they could move the cows more easily without causing stress and worrying about animals in the same Next, we have the Fairmount Dairy. Uh, this is located in East Montclair, Vermont, and the owners of this operation are Richard and Bonnie Hall and Tucker Purchase. And they are milking 1,200 cows, and their goal is to keep the cows happy and healthy at all times. Uh, one of their outreaches to the community is they created the Utterly Crazy 4-H Club, and this is an outreach to the youth as they want to interest them in the industry. And also, they have a 360 Degree view of mountains, so they have a really nice wedding venue that they have available. Uh, one of the cool things that they had at the dairy was they had the new calf mob feeder, and that was built in 2011. And this allows the calves free choice milk and has a new ventilation system that supplies the calves with fresh air at all times. In the barn, there are eight calves per pen, and they can have 130 calves in the whole barn. But one of the problems was they had management issues as they had to adjust to uh, the new needs uh, to keep the cats healthy and monitor, monitor them. And these are our fearless leaders coming across the top of the screen. <laughs> At the Fairmount Dairy, they're always transporting cows. And they uh, stopped tail docking because of public uh, concern. And there are two, two uh, the children of the owners, are Claire and Ricky, and they actually went through this program, and they went to Cornell, but now they worked off the farm for a couple of years. They worked as uh, a farm credit agent and a Holstein classifier, but now they've worked themselves back into the dairy, and they want to come home. Uh, we went to Newmont Farm in Vermont, and their owners were Walter and Margaret Gladstone, and their son, Will Gladstone, was a current manager. And Will wished that he had gone somewhere else to work before he returned home, just so he could get more experience. They, their herd size is 1,250 cows, and they use sand to bed, and they bed heavier than most, so I mean, the cows are more comfortable. Um, they crop 1,800 to 2,000 acres, and 190,000 pounds. They have 130 calves on hill, and they bed the shaving for three weeks. Cats are in groups of 10 and they are made by 6 to 7 weeks. They have a double 20 parallel parlor and it's a direct load, which the milk goes right onto the trailer, which there's not a lot of those, and we saw a lot of them in Wisconsin actually. And um, the milk will fill the trailer in about 14 hours. They average 84 to 87 pounds per cow and they ship the milk to their farm. Uh, last farm in Wisconsin was Free Brothers Farm, 100 cows. The most cow dairy, 1,700 acres, they average about 30,000 pounds per cow. 
Uh, there's four brothers, Charles, George, Thomas, and Mark. They uh, power their farm and their cheese plant to methane digesters, and they use the manure out of methane digesters to uh, send it through a liquid solid separator to use the solid to bed their cows. The cheese plant, they make all kinds of cheese, and these are their most uh, bought. Barber string, skim cheese, fresh mozzarella, and marsh pepper. Um, at the Windsor Dairy, they milk 1,300 cows and they crop 242,400 acres of corn and 3,600 acres of grass and alfalfa. And they're located in Harpersville, New York. Uh, the Windsor Dairy is a multiple generation dairy farm. And the new generation that's coming back to the farm is Stephen and Eric Windsor. And Eric and Stephen, they went to college at Cornell, and, I, and they went through this program as well. But um, Eric had a spot open for him when he came back to the dairy on the crop side. But Stephen wasn't as fortunate as um, he wanted to work on the herd side of the dairy. So he has to work in as the calf manager, and he has had um, some considered off the farm employment to get more experience as well. And the boys are very involved in the community, as in the fire in the fire department, and they have a lot of employees that work on the school board as well. And this is um, where Stephen works in one of his calf barns. They have a tunnel ventilated barn, and they use um, they do not have a mob feeder in this barn, but in their other barn they use a mob feeder as well. Uh, I'd like to invite up the next group of technical skills in the industry and career fields. this year was Dairy Discovery, which is a statewide annual program that's offered to all youth that are interested in the dairy industry. And um, they do uh, rotating themes such as calf and heifer management, milk and milk quality, dairy nutrition, whole farm management, and herd health and management, which was this year's theme. Uh, some of the workshops we did this year were uh, demonstrations of of trimming. We were able to watch them uh, work on cadavers. We also learned how to properly measure the hoof length and um, how to balance the hooves properly according to how the cow walks. Uh, some of the other workshops we did, we compared and dissected diseased and healthy organs. The organs we looked at were the liver, heart, and lungs. And we saw the effects that these uh, diseases had on the organs. And we also learned um, how to perform a physical examination on a cow. That might include um, temperature, uh, heart rate, and uh, proper digestion in the rumen. Washington screen, and then there we can uh, 
what ingredients are fully digested, then we discuss how we could uh, adjust the feed because that way they increase the digestion of the fish. Alright, we uh, toured GenX and CRI facility in Ithaca, New York. Uh, they have an on site semen collection, testing, and packaging, packaging and distribution. Uh, they sell supplies to aid in reproduction management. Uh, we had a, a seminar by Ivor Jones and Kevin Zimba from Sex Sire Powers about reproduction tract anatomy and proper AI procedures. Here we are at Cornell's Dairy, uh, which we had about 20 uh, cows we were uh, practicing AI on. Before we did practice on the cows, we did on cavaliers, and then we did on the do not breed cows. So on our trip to Vermont, we visited Nature Farm Credit, which is a Vermont-based um, lending cooperative, and it's a resource to farmers in Vermont, New York, and New Hampshire. It offers competitive loans, leases, tax preparations, financial records, and payroll services. So when a farmer asks or requests a uh, loan, the farm credit looks at five factors or their five C's and they are character, which is what they emphasize because when they're building relationships with their customers, uh, this is very important. Capital, capacity, conditions, and collateral. And based upon these factors, they will determine whether or not they will approve the request for a loan. Back earlier this year, we had Blue Steam from Team Associates come in and talk to us. Gave us some pointers on like establishing a farm advisory team on your farm to help um, make things run more smoothly and more efficiently. And uh, it works with many people from all aspects in the um, industry. Um, while I was here, we went over some advantages to a farm advisory team. And, uh, Having a farm advisor team, you have everyone from the farm communicating about um, everything happening. And uh, your discussions can lead to you know, better ideas to further progress um, everything and developing smart goals for the farm advisory team. And um, smart goals are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and timely. And uh, but some disadvantages is when you hire people, they're not always familiar with every aspect on your farm. You know, you can't have a veterinarian come in all the time and, you know, tell them to go mix feed or do anything else. Or you can't have a lot of things. You know? Finding a time when everyone's available because you have to work around everyone else's schedules. Like, some people work very late and some others you know, they're done by 3 o'clock in the afternoon just because of how the farm works. You know, we also talk about money personalities. You know, a saver, someone who saves their money, just you know, a spender will spend their money. A money monk is someone who uh, believes that they're above money and that they don't need it. As an avoider will just totally avoid making transactions all together. We also toured um, Mercer Miller Plant. In uh, Syracuse, and the uh, tour was organized by uh, John Clark from Northeast Ag and Feed Alliance. And uh, Mercer Milling provides formulas, minerals, and um, vitamins for one of the uh, 13 states around here, and uh, various types of animals. And, uh, they also sell milk replacer, fat products, medicated feeds, and uh, other supplies. They don't sell the products directly to farmers. It's they sell them to a middleman and a distributor. And, uh, while we were there, we learned about certifications and acts they had to go through to be qualified to sell medicated feeds. And, uh, here, Rachel is uh, breeding a cow, and we have Hunter uh, hugging Austin. And uh, we'd like to put up longer to your farm now.
Hi, I'm Tyler King from Tyler County. I'm Jennifer King from St. Lawrence County. Uh, I'm Travis Nelson from Brickford County. Uh, I'm Hunter Meager from Ontario County. I'm Dalton Gerhardt from Erie County. So one of the first farms that we toured in Wisconsin was Rosendale Dairy. Um, Rosendale is owned by Milk Source. It's one of four different facilities that Milk Source owns, um, such as Tiny View, Omro, Rosendale, and New Chester. Uh, Rosen, er, Milk Source owns about 26,000 cows between the four facilities, and there's 8,000 at this specific facility. Um, something interesting about Rosendale and you, that you don't see a lot of, uh, in New York is they have cross-ventilated barns with cellulose panels and they also have um, a direct load pickup. They have two 80 stall rotary parlors and they bed with sand and reclaim about 90% of that. They make about 700,000 pounds of milk per day and calves are transported uh, to milk so or to calf source after one day. In the rotary parlor, it takes about 6.2 seconds for a cow to, to load and unload one stall. Each cow is on the rotary for about eight minutes at a time, getting milk for approximately five or six, and they're milked three times a day. Cows average about 90 pounds per day, and each cow is away from its stall for about one hour. They have a direct load pickup, and it's about 14 trucks per day. And that's just some of the rodent butter. And you can see that um, their workers are on the outside and they stand there. And um, the person giving the tour to us, they told us that um, they like them on the outside just standing there because it, it, it doesn't tire them out as much as um, a parallel parlor would. And another thing is the cross ventilation with cellulose panels. Um, it, the, Cellulose panels helps to maintain a controlled environment year-round, and it allows for greater control of flies and birds. Um, they produce a constant air flow, and they are costly. Um, some of the disadvantages are that the cellulose panels get clogged very easily, um, but the water runs down the cellulose panels, and um, the fans on the opposite side suck the air through, and there are baffles um, that help keep the uh, wind, uh, the wind um, over the cows, and it creates about a six mile per hour wind. So then we went to Wholesome Dairy. They have two separate farms, and on each farm they have 4,000 cows each. 80 employees all together, 40 for each farm. Um, something different about this farm is they very they focus on energy efficiency. They had one 80 stall rotary parlor. Um, their cows were averaging 85 pounds, and they were also milked three times a day. The cows here were only within their stalls for 45 minutes, and they got 500 cows milk per hour. So on their energy efficiency, they had a methane digester, which generated electricity. And the electricity, they actually had to sell to the electric company, and then they had to buy it back from them. They had photoelectric eyes, thermostats, and timers, and water sprinklers and fans, minimizing the amount of water used to cool the cows, so they weren't like wasting any. Um, they had weekly and daily water leak inspections to make sure nothing was going wrong. And in the spring and fall, they allowed the community members to come in and take manure for their gardens. The next farm we toured in Wisconsin was the Weezy Brothers farm. The Weezy Brothers milked 4,500 cows three times a day. They had cross ventilation barns. They shipped seven tractor trailloads of milk a day. They had two parlors, a double 30 and a double 24 parallel parlor. They milk 360 cows per hour, on average 92 pounds of milk without BSD. They truck cows from one farm to another once a week. More about the Weezy Brothers is the Weezy Brothers preferred to be overcrowded because then the cows were always eating. They had 600 calf clutches on the farm. The calves were fed waste milk, and when they were born, they were given one gallon of cloth from 30 minutes after being born. Bottle fed calves were for the first 14 days. Uh, the vaccinations, uh, Weezy Brother Dairy uh, didn't vaccinate their calves until uh, seven weeks of age. It's said that was uh, best for their system. But as in uh, Hall's Calf Ranch, they, at day one when they got them, they are after the tag them. At day two, they took blood and uh, needed the respiratory 
vaccine or the they are given a full shield shot. And uh, the land sources, all three of these farms uh, are short of land. Uh, Rosemary had 19 acres of bunk silos. They ran, run about 8 to 10 choppers at a time. And they had 50,000 acres. And Weezy Brothers had 6,000 acres. <coughs> and uh, needed 10. So they bought 1,500 acres of corn this year. And uh, Wilson Dairy only had 700 acres. And they uh, had a gentleman's agreement to buy the majority of their feed from other farms. When we were in Wisconsin, we uh, went to two different calf farms. Um, each of them had a lot, a lot of calves. Um, first one I went to is Calf Source. Uh, milk Source owns Calf Source. Um, all of Milk Source's calves, they go to the Calf Source and they own. They've got 3,500 hutches at their place. At any given time, they'll have got up over 10,000 calves on their, at their facilities. They stay there for six months and they get shipped to Kansas. Um, they've got 20,000 20, calves in Kansas, in addition to the calves they got there in Wisconsin. They've got 18 to 20 employees that run their uh, facilities in Kansas, or, I'm sorry, Wisconsin, not Kansas. Um, they wean the calves at 40 days of age, they bed the, ca the calves with uh, straw, and they clean them out every two months. Then the other place we went to was Hall's Calf Ranch. Paul's Calf Ranch was started in 95. Um, they started off with 15 hutches. Now they've got uh, 7,000 calves that are under four months of age there. They uh, pick up their calves at one day old from various farms. They've got 26 farms that are um, all together to or ship the calves there. They don't grow any feed for the calves. They buy all the feed from, for them. They're, Calves get weaned at six to seven weeks old. They dehorn them at three weeks. They got three to four hundred calves that they bottle feed in a day. And then after two to three days, they switch them all over to pails. So they've got a lot of calves that are in those couple days old. If they're, they're feeding three to four hundred calves with their bottles. Um, right now, they've got five thousand hutches and they're currently expanding. Down that panorama on the bottom there, it's field of how they're expanding. It's kind of hard to see in the picture, sorry. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Taylor and, uh, and Jen, I'm sorry, for our, uh, your review. So to recap the year, um, we learned about how many different jobs are out there in the dairy industry. And there's not just one job that's for you. You can go and try out many things. And there are so many opportunities out there. And we learned that from many of our speakers that we've had throughout the year. And we've also learned that certain things work on certain farms. So you should stick to what your farm strengths are. But like, don't try, like, you can try things, but stick to the strength of your farm because there are many different management styles that you have throughout different farms. Also, um, we met a lot of new people, like these guys, for example. We came in not knowing each other. and. Thank you to Debbie and Dave for letting us stay at your house. That was kind of like a bonding experience for us. But we've also met um, some people from like ADHC, like Beth Myers, and also from Team Associates, and just so many opportunities that we've had. Um, we also got to learn a lot about ourselves, taking personality tests, finding out what our personalities are, our, our strengths and weaknesses. We also got to learn about, a lot about each other. Like she said, we stayed at Deb and Davies. Dave's house, so then we had a lot of bond, they staying up late, talking. Um, we had so many experiences that we wouldn't have had without this program. <laughs> Going to Wisconsin, getting to tour all the large dairy farms, the 4-H conference, and meeting so many new people. Um, we also learned problem solving that can be applied to real life, communication with each other, working together, and stuff that will help us like later on, whatever next, whatever is next in our lives. I really wanted to take a minute to um, thank our sponsors because without them this wouldn't have been possible. So we have Pro Dairy, the Pro Dairy Program, Cornell University Department of Animal Science, Northeast Agricultural Education Foundation, Cargill Animal Nutrition, Team Associates, Northeast Agribusiness and Feed Alliance, Northeast Farm Credit Ag Enhancement Program, New York Corn and so Soybean Growers Association, 
Air State 4-H Foundation, Professional Dairy Producers Foundation, Flex Sire Power, and Gen X slash CRI. So can we give them a round of applause please? Taking questions. Or the whole group. Yes, the whole group. Did they do an awesome job up there? So I'd say the size and scale, and again, it depends on each farm. Like Hunter said, every farm is different. 
So um, same as New York, but Wisconsin's just, it's a lot bigger, it's a lot more open and things like that. Right, that's how you answer a question, all right? <laughs> I have a question. Uh, I'm very jealous of the experience that you uh, young people had. Uh, what a wonderful opportunity to see those farms in Wisconsin and other places that we talk together and so forth share ideas. How do you, does a young person get selected to do all this? It's not easy. I guess that question was for us up here. Um, for a young person to um, be considered for the program, they do have to apply to the program. It's an application process and it's a selective application process. They, um, you know, the kids have to uh, submit an essay um, telling us why they want to be in the program, what they hope to learn, what they hope, what they think they can bring to the program. You know, a little bit about themselves, their experiences, how they like to further that, and you know, what their career goals or career things that they're thinking about. And they are also accompanied with. They have to have two letters of recommendation outside of their um, their family. Uh, this year. We may have to be doing some interviews. Um, uh, <laughs> we've had 57 young people apply to the program this year. Um, we've had 40 kids apply to the program. 40's been about the cap, and it's a bittersweet for me. I've really uh, lost some sleep over it because um, we've uh, there's a committee of us that review the applicants and then make selections, and and it's, you know it's based on the information that we get that comes in. Um, we've not had to turn that many kids away from the program before, and it's a real struggle, and um, we've talked to Tom, Director of Primary, on you know, what we're gonna do, and you know, we're, we're working through it, and we'll see what happens, but I think it, it says a lot if there's 57 young people out there that wanna be part of this program, and um, you know, the, I, the word has come from the kids before them that have come to, gone through the program, and I see a lot of alumni in the room today, and that says a lot that you know they're here and the impact that's had on them and going forward. So that's how the selection process is. <laughs>